Today I would like to talk about uh, TC and CLS BPF, the work we've been doing um, mostly uh, over the course of uh, last NetDev since, since now. Um, basically this talk, like in the previous NetDev, I gave an overview um, about the eBPF architecture in general. And this one is like, a, in some sense, a continuation of it. Um, but we, uh, like in, in the sense that we want to go more into a deep dive of some of the features that have been added. Just to give you a big picture, um, I think we've heard it already many times. <laughs> um, it's a, so eBPF is an efficient and generic uh, in-kernel uh, bytecode engine that can solve specific problems, specific use cases. The, um, it's used mainly in, in three different um, contexts, which is networking, tracing, and security slash sandboxing. In networking, uh, the two main users are, or not only two, but uh, main users are TC, then XDP, which is evolving. Uh, we have it in socket filters. We've seen yesterday the talk on Suricata. Um, we have it in SRE reuse port, uh, where we can uh, do demuxing. For, for the tracing part, there's, uh, there are like two front ends today where you can use it, which is uh, perf tool itself that can load PPF programs, or uh, the BCC, which is from the IOVISA project, which is another front end for doing mostly tracing. It has a couple of tracing scripts. In sandboxing, it's like seccomp. I mean, it's not really EPPF, but like in the kernel it is. But uh, the uh, uh, front end there, it's classic BPF, we call. And there's some work going on in um, putting eBPF into Linux security modules and LSMs. It's not yet merged, but some stuff is brewing there as well. So for, it, for the TC subsystem, um, the, uh, so we, we were looking into CLS BPF, which is uh, in some sense classifier, but not only that, it can also do actions as well in, in that sense. Um, it can be attached to, uh, to ingress and egress of the kernel networking data path. And a typical workflow that you would have is you uh, have like a restricted C program, you compile that with LLVM, it has an eBPF backend, it generates an object file, which is like, a, like an, an, an L file that uh, TC can, can parse and load into the kernel. So those things happen in user space and in the kernel side you have a verifier that makes sure the program doesn't do uh, various uh, stuff like uh, crashing the kernel or uh, making it unstable. And after that has been passed, it goes into a just-in-time compiler and then the uh, CLS BPF part itself can take the program and hook it into the data path. And last but not least, if there's an offload available, then it, could, it can also offload it to hardware. Um, I see uh, CLS BPF as a uh, complementary part to, to the work that is ongoing for XDP in the sense that um, it, it works on all net devices, so you can also put this to a, to a weave device, for example, for managing your containers. Um, it works on SKB as an input context, so you have a couple of more information available, and it can be hooked to not only ingress, but also egress. So in the architecture itself, it consists of, I'm um, just going over this really quickly, and it consists of uh, 11 64-bit uh, registers. Some of them are general purpose, some of them are, have a special purpose. For example, you have one that, is, uh, that holds frame pointer. Um, then there are uh, like a couple of registers which are for passing arguments, and there's one specific for return code. Um, you can use it for, it also has 32-bit sub-registers, which um, in particular, um, uh, classic PPF, like the transformation makes use of. It has a limited stack space, program counter implicitly. The instructions, they are 64-bit wide, the same like with classic BPF, and you can have maximum 4,069 instructions per program. Like there are a couple of new instructions over the classic one, uh, like you have this call instruction, um, can uh, make use of uh, helper calls, what that thing is, I'm going to talk a bit in a moment. Uh, you have uh, con instructions for the whole 64-bit um, uh, operations. You have uh, uh, NDMS con con conversion, and so on and so forth. There are a couple of core components that are important to know. Uh, you have a so-called context, which is like, a, like an input um, that the EPPF program works on. 
uh, which can be which is different like can, can be an SKB in the networking context uh, for XTP it's uh, as has been shown I think yesterday it's like an XTP buff it's something um, more uh, shrinked than that and for, from the perf from the tracing side it's various other things like your like registers from that are currently in, uh, in, in the system and um, yeah so you can read and write uh, to this context what, so what you can read and write to is being made sure by the verifier itself so that uh, is uh, restricted um, the same uh, as how it is being accessed uh, so that you don't uh, have an unaligned access for example um, yeah then we have the helper function concept helper function they are part of the core kernel so no modular code can add or extend um, their own functionality to EPPF. It, it has to go into the core kernel up, upstream uh, if you want to make use of that. And uh, yeah, so those helper functions they uh, yeah they they uh, provide basically some some help. For example, if you have a socket buffer, it, it can do some mangling that otherwise the program itself cannot do. Um, then you have maps, which are some efficient uh, key value stores in the kernel uh, that EBPF programs use. Those maps, they can be uh, arbitrarily shared, which means one or more EPPF program can use the same map. Um, and it can also be shared not only between uh, those EPPF programs, but also uh, between uh, user space. So they can also access this at the same time. <clears throat> then tail calls, this is a concept. Um, where one EPPF program can call into another one and to uh, redirect execution. It, it, it doesn't return back to the, to the previous one um, and there's a limit in how, in how deep you can nest uh, those tail calls as well. Then we have object pinning, which is interesting um, when you have, for example, TC loading programs into the kernel because everything from user space side is managed over a file descriptor and you need to somehow keep that uh, alive in some sense because other like management um, um, demons, they want to access maps at a, at a later point in time as well. So you so you pin, for example, maps to uh, um, to, to some location, and then you can retrieve it at a later point. Um, yeah, in the kernel itself, uh, since it doesn't have the classic um, BPF interpreter anymore, it has to transform uh, like a um, uh, it, it, it has to migrate those programs that uh, still like TCP dump or other users load into from classic BPF into uh, eBPF. From the LVM side, there's the already mentioned the BPF backend that we have that can generate uh, the code from uh, front ends like like C, like uh, Clang, and the kernel has uh, various uh, JIT backends. Some some are still classic BPF, um, some are eBPF as well. Management is uh, over system call, the PPF system call, and uh, with that also the, the API has to keep it uh, stable. So regarding um, the CLS PPF um, and also a new QDisk that we added some time ago, which is called um, CLS Act QDisk. So the CLS Act QDisk itself is just very simple, similar to the Ingress QDisk. It's, a, it's basically a container for holding uh, TC classifiers and, and, and actions. Um, and it provides uh, two central hooks into the kernel, uh, one on the ingress side. It's like the same hook like you have with the ingress QDisk, but uh, it, um, it's a net receive SKB core. And from the ingress side, it's DevQX MIT. Um, it's just for compatibility reasons why it's not in the ingress QDisk itself. But yeah, so those two hooks, they are really powerful. They're on central places and you can um, uh, uh, run CLS BPF on top of that. And um, yeah, CLS BPF, as I said, it, it runs also classic BPF, which it was in the very in, in early days when it was submitted to the kernel and it got extended. You can do also uh, atomic updates during runtime, either from CLS BPF side itself, it's, it's converted to RCU, um, but also from, from tail call, uh, from, from tail calls. It can also be updated. And in that you have a fast path, which means uh, CLS PPF can be run in direct action mode. Um, usually you would uh, hook into various kind of actions, but in, in that case, since EPPF program can already do everything by itself, it can just return an action verdict and you're done with it. 
So um, the way we use it, for example, in NTC is to just uh, load a single uh, object which does all the work and then we can already return, uh, which gives a better uh, performance as well from software side. And there's now also an offload interface uh, that drivers can use. Um, and so far we have one driver <laughs> for that, which is great. I'll go into that a bit later in my talk. The TC uh, front end, it has the uh, EPPF loader. Uh, it's doing quite a bit of work in the sense that it has to pass all the sections uh, from the object file. Um, sections can contain like data for map specifications that the kernel has to set up and push, into the, um, push over the VPF system call, retrieve the file descriptor, and then um, TC does some relocation handling, which means it uh, injects the file descriptor into the specific instructions as a immediate value, which the kernel then uh, makes sure that it, accesses the, uh, that it can actually access this map. Um, and it also does object uh, pinning and retrieving, so that uh, you can share uh, the maps between various programs. Just to give you an example, um, so you would, com you would compile uh, your, your program with, with Clang, then you can add um, a QDisk, the CLS Act QDisk to a device, you can, you can show it that it's uh, added, then you uh, have some simple commands like TC filter add and specify a specific device, then you have two parent uh, names, one for ingress, one for egress, and then you have the BPS classifier, direct action mode, you specify the particular object, and then some sections. So there can be multiple programs uh, contained in a single uh, object file, and you can specify which one you want to load uh, based on the section name. Then you can do a TC filter show, and when you want to remove uh, those classifiers again, um, one extension that we added is that you don't have to specify the, the priority um, and then it would remove if you just uh, specify the parent itself, in this case, for example, ingress or egress, then it would remove all classifiers that are hooked into that. And last but not least, you can, of course, also remove the QDisk itself. So some of the extensions, so um, we have the tunneling and, and, and encapsulation, so we, uh, with uh, CLSPPF supports uh, collect metadata tunnels, um, which is a nice way how to scale your, your tunnels because you only have a single net device, uh, which is set into collect metadata mode, so you don't have to have uh, specific configurations for your tunnel uh, that are replicated over multiple uh, net devices, but you just have a single one. Supported for this infrastructure so far is uh, VXLAN, Geneve, GRE, various IP and IP. Uh, tunnels and probably in future maybe also other uh, other encapsulations like goo I think are possible to uh, to extend as well um, <clears throat> so there's like a, a key structure that uh, BPF programs fill out on the on, on its on their stack uh, which is kind of a generic structure that we can then push into uh, some of the helper functions uh, that then convert to the uh, specific tunnel uh, tunneling in, uh, infrastructure for example, the tunnel ID, which can be V and I, then we have a V4, V6 uh, destination, uh, various other fields, TOS, TTL, like flow labels, which is also interesting. Yeah, And then for tunnel options themselves, this, they're like raw blobs, um, which in case, so, so far only uh, VXLAN and Geneve support that, and uh, it's group-based policy in case of VXLAN for Geneve, it's like a, like a TLV blob, like from the protocol itself, which works fine. I mean, it's but so definitely that at least we have a way to pass that down, and it's generic, still generic enough for all the uh, various backends. On a, so it, the, how this whole thing works, it's like we have a metadata DSD structure, which like a, which is like a DSD entry, and um, Basically, the, the, the tunneling information is attached to that so that when uh, SKB uh, passes through the driver it, uh, itself, it can read out the data or it can fill it on receive um, for a later point in time. Yeah, and there are like uh, four helpers, uh, two for uh, getting and setting the tunnel information and two for the options. So then uh, something uh, we added recently, direct packet access. 
I want to go into some more details here. Um, from the classic BPF side, there were like two instructions um, uh, load, so BPF LD um, for, uh, for an absolute load and for an indirect load. Indirect load means that you have a register and then an immediate value, and then this is um, uh, uh, both added um, together for the actual location to load data from. And this was basically carried into eBPF over from the classic uh, version. Um, the reason for this is because uh, uh, the just-in-time compilers have a, an optimization for that so that they can access this faster because uh, they, they cache uh, SKP data and some things in the, uh, in the image itself. So you don't have to call into some helper for that, for example. And LVM, they uh, had to introduce uh, some built-in helpers for that. You can load one, two, and four bytes. They're in host NDNS because it, was the, it, it, it simply was the way in, in classic BPF as well. Um, the problem with that is also uh, that, there, that they have some suboptimal extension, uh, uh, exception handling in the sense when you have a wrong offset or then the program basically aborts, which is fine for classic stuff, but for uh, eBPF you want to have some more graceful um, handling on that, on that side. And yeah. Then we have helper functions. So we have a BPF SKB load bytes helper. Um, you don't have to, it, it, it doesn't require any JIT or LVM special handling, which is nice. You can load multiple bytes, so just more than uh, the uh, restrictions from the instructions themselves. You can, it's only limited by the stack space itself. Um, it's loaded into the stack, and uh, because of the helper function itself, you can also do exception handling. Then for the uh, storing, so for storing themselves, for, for storing itself, there, there weren't any special instructions in classic BPF or so. So um, a helper was for eBPF. Helper was added a longer time ago that um, can basically do this uh, store data into the SKB. So it also comes with the same properties and aspects of helpers themselves. Um, you can handle uh, uh, exceptions, and uh, if it. And, and it does internally some stuff like uncloning SKB if it has to, or it pulls in uh, nonlinear data if uh, the amount of data you want to store in uh, reaches further than just the linear part. It has some um, other options like uh, checksum updating or clearing hash. Yeah. And the direct packet access itself that was added, it also was added to XDP, so a um, little bit of the same. Uh, properties uh, uh, ap ap apply here. Um, it tries to combine at the advantage of both of them, of both of the other methods. Um, the SKB context itself um, got two new members, so data and data end, and they can be loaded into register directly, which is nice. You don't have to go over the stack necessarily. Uh, it doesn't require any uh, JIT or LVM special handling. So it just works out of the box for the kernel, from kernel side. Um, the complexity, however, was pushed more in, in, into the verifier um, in the sense that the verifier uh, does some pattern matching. It, it tracks uh, like, a, like um, some con con conditional. When you have data plus x, so plus a constant offset, if that reaches further than the data end, um, then you basically have two branches. One is the two branch and the other one is the false. And um, you have to track on both branches um, uh, basically how much data you can actually access uh, later on. Um, uh, yeah, so it, it uh, also needs to take that into account and that you don't um, have things like overflows in your, um, in your access. So it is, it's a little bit complicated, the, the, the details, um, but seems to work fine so far. <laughs> um, and you also have uh, the implicit uh, ex exception handling uh, that we saw from uh, uh, from earlier from from other methods as well. Because if if it's uh, larger than data end, then you can still do something like uh, put some notification somewhere or uh, push some message to uh, uh, for for further debugging. Um, the right part it has to be strictly uncloned, of course. Um, and since this only works in the linear part, there's a helper that, in case you really need to go further than that, it, uh, you can pull in nonlinear data as well. 
and you just need to do this probably once and then you can still access the rest uh, like the normal direct access way with this single test. So then um, the other feature is the event output notification. So the idea is basically that you have a helper function um, where you can push some data um, into, uh, from, uh, from the kernel to the user space direction. Um, this, this thing works over uh, lockless memory mapped uh, and per CPU uh, ring buffer, basically from perf infrastructure, the whole facility was originally in tracing and we found this pretty useful and also it was like low hanging fruit to add it for the networking side as well. Um, for use, user space side can either busy ball if it wants to or it can uh, define some wake up events for either number of events or like some watermark for the number of bytes. And the nice thing about this is that the ring buffer slot itself is fully programmable, so this thing is not part of the UABI, and you can, for example, put uh, SKB mark or whatever you have, want to have as uh, data in this thing, um, and it's useful for things like sampling, uh, monitoring, or debugging, or if you have management demons that need some push notifications to, to act or to update uh, maps, for example. Um, we use this in a project which is called Cilium that we are working on, I'm not going into the details of uh, the Cilium project too much, but there we use it, for example, as a drop monitor, and we can do some policy learning with that. Uh, we have like a pa uh, uh, packet tracing infrastructure um, where we can see that uh, what, what paths the program takes through our code. And it's also really useful as a uh, trace print K replacement because trace print K is rather slow. And um, tracing, but also for networking side, uh, it's, it's used here because you just push in some binary data instead of uh, having the kernel having to uh, uh, assemble a, a string for that. Then some words about uh, just-in-time compilers, uh, about offloading and uh, JIT hardening. So the EPBF compilers that are available today are x86, we have ARM64, uh, PowerPC64 and S390, so they all support uh, eBPF. Hopefully, more to, hopefully, uh, more JIT compilers to come. Um, the PowerPC64 was uh, initially, or the, um, got merged just recently. I think the initial merge was in 4.8, and like in, in this window, 4.9, also the tail call support got added, because tail, tail call is uh, a bit more complicated. So I got it later on. Also, for the ARM64 uh, telecall support was added for 4.9, uh, along with some other optimizations. The only thing still missing is the atomic add, um, but I guess that will also come soon. But otherwise, they are uh, pretty much feature complete. Um, now there's also an, an, an offloading possibility as I initially mentioned, so you can load eBPF uh, to, to, a, to, to, a, to a NIC, and this is uh, supported by Netronome Smart NICs uh, through a just-in-time compiler, which is really great, and there will be a talk later in the afternoon about how it's done and how that stuff works, so I encourage you to uh, go there as well. Um, in terms of hardening, there are some hardening measures uh, that are done by default, so um, it, so nothing that uh, so something that has not, not to do necessarily with JITs is that uh, the EPPF image itself is being locked as read only for the interpreter part in case there are some corruptions, but also for the for the uh, resulting JIT image. So if you use one of those JITs, I think except PowerPC 64, there it's not the case. But otherwise, those pages are also locked as read only; they cannot be modified. And by default, they have like a uh, randomized start address uh, where you have, uh, if, so if you would jump into that uh, area that is before that, you would basically have like a trap and um, hang your kernel. Um, the reason why this is done was because there uh, was uh, some, some work on JIT spraying. Um, I have to explain a bit more on that. It's basically you, you, you inject lots of uh, programs into the kernel, uh, lots of, for example, socket filters from user space side and those constants that are uh, put uh, uh, along with the programs, they can, for example, uh, uh, also can contain some um, 
some, some actual opcodes from one of the architecture stuff, and then if you have a bug somewhere else in the kernel that could jump into that, then we certainly want to avoid that, right? And that's why those measures are being added. And recently from the kernel hardening project, uh, some researcher found out that um, there, there are still some way to, to uh, um, uh, where, where we can have this randomized gap, uh, where we can overcome this uh, limitation. So that's why we added the uh, constant blinding infrastructure, which basically means that those constants, they're, they're basically blinded out, so it cannot inject um, some arbitrary opcodes. Um, this is being added to a SysCTL. So if the value uh, BBFG Harden is set on one, then programs are constant blinded for unprivileged uh, users, um, but not for privileged ones. So root, root only can still uh, and enjoy the full performance of that. You also have a mode two, which is useful for testing. You have this uh, test suite in the kernel, so we can make sure that uh, we don't have any regressions there. And um, yeah, so what it does is basically it rewrites the instructions on a BPF instruction level, so it doesn't really have to touch much of the JIT compilers themselves, so it can be easily supported, and it rewrites those 32 and 64 bits which is also a concern because it's like more, more space for in, injecting stuff and it uh, blinds those uh, in, instructions. And how it does it is basically uh, you have a randomized value, you have like a helper register, an additional one, which is only visible for, uh, for JITs and you uh, randomize your original instruction. So you basically XOR uh, that one and you store it uh, in, in the first one and then you XOR and then you have a second instruction which you XOR um, with the previous one as well to get back to the original value. And, you, and then you have to rewrite your original instructions or operation that you're doing from an uh, immediate base to, to a register-based one. So <clears throat> just to give you some example, uh, this is from the uh, original blog post. Uh, like you have a couple of uh, in, uh, loads for, for immediate. And as you can see here, um, if, you in, if you inject uh, something like that, then the resulting uh, byte stream from the just-in-time compiler would look, look like uh, this first uh, part here, uh, where the X, Y, Z, and P, Q, and R's uh, are part of the um, uh, in, in, in injected in, in instructions. And if you jump off by one into this whole thing, then you could suddenly execute those payload, right? So if you blind all of this stuff out, then it's just randomized stuff. So it, it, you cannot really, um, you would probably crash your machine or whatever. So this is just one example, but of course, um, all the instructions that are relevant are uh, being blinded. So just to give some summary of all of uh, the, the stuff uh, from, the, from the functionality side. So you have the SKBuf uh, shadow uh, structure. It has the, for the SKB metadata access, there are some of the members uh, uh, mapped for, for that. And the kernel, like after verification time, um, it, it rewrites the, 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 the access. So in, in, the, in your programs, you use this underscore underscore SKBuf, and if you load this into the kernel, then uh, uh, this, the, the instructions are rewritten to access the actual SKB data eventually. And um, from, from the helpers, so basically the main areas uh, that CLS BPF covers um, is you have packet access and mangling, um, you have map access, there are per CPU maps, also pre allocated maps. Uh, that you can access and update or delete from program side. You have helpers for checksum mangling, where you can, for example, pass in just a div and this gets updated. Uh, we have redirection forwarding, so you can either clone SKB and redirect from there, or after the program exits, it redirects uh, the SKB. There's integration for uh, cgroup v1 and v2, some helpers for that. Then the tunneling stuff that I already explained, uh, you have some protocol, you have helper for protocol mig migration where you can um, f uh, implement NAT64 functionality. Uh, you have uh, some packet size, some restricted packet size mangling, routing realms, tail calls, and so on. So quite a bit of stuff that you can, like, like uh, as building blocks that you can 
uh, tailor for your specific use case. A couple of next steps. So the next thing I'm trying to look at is to have some collect metadata like API for, for crypto integration. So for example, that we can uh, manage uh, things like uh, MacSec or, or um, I, 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 uh, IPSec um, on devices. Um, we definitely need to improve the verifier a bit in terms of logging. So currently it uh, dumps quite a lot of stuff and you probably don't need to have a look at all of this. Some code annotations would be really useful so you can trace uh, why it's complaining in your original program. Um, we have to look into if there are some possibilities. Then we talked already at NetConf about some better introspection facilities. Uh, did you know what kind of stuff is running and um, the code signing, what came also on the table, which may be interesting. <clears throat> From the uh, testing and uh, also sample code side, it would be useful, I think, to uh, have a, a whole bunch of tests in the kernel self-testing framework so that also build works possibly pick this stuff up and can make sure we don't regress on anything. And of course, uh, the documentation is so far a bit lacking behind on what the implementation status is. So we definitely um, like man pages and things like that. And uh, we have to improve on that as well. So there's lots of stuff to do. Uh, the code, uh, it's all on git.kernel.org. So the, and the mainline kernel and IPR2 tree. And um, I just talked a bit about the Cilium stuff. It's all, ah, software updates. <laughs> I will click remind me later for the next talk. <laughs> um, the Cilium project, if you want to have a look at what we are doing there uh, regarding uh, BPF and containers, it's also all open source on github.com uh, slash Cilium. Didn't cover it here, but in case. Uh, and otherwise, some further information also on the paper, like the from the NetDev 1.1, the previous paper about the architecture itself and some of the stuff I was talking about here with a bit of more sample code as well. Um, yeah, and otherwise, uh, the documentation from the kernel tree and man pages. And in case you still want some sticker, I have a BPF a sticker here or outside, <laughs> in case you're interested in that. Anyway, so are there some questions, comments, or things? <clears throat> Teams, uh, oh, I should install that update, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, if not, then thanks a lot. I'm also in the hallway, so if you want to catch me. Thanks.